Deja vu. <laughs> a BK Precision Electronic Multimeter Model 290. Uh, no, this is not a repeat of the last one I just did. That one's actually <laughs> right there. Um, and I'd actually checked my inventory. I actually had, up until now, I had three. When I got that one over there, I rebuilt that one. That's the one that needed a, a potentiometer uh, replaced in it. Actually, for the position, it's, this one's in for the high-power ohms range. Um, got that one fixed up, and... Yeah, I change equipment on my bench like most people change socks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I I have so much now. I cycle some of my, especially my older vintage meters, um, on and off of the bench. And I took the old uh, Sentinel, which is a kind of a military grade HP 410 series multimeter. I just moved that over here to the side because I still want that one you know, within arm's reach of this bench because that one can do extremely high frequencies. But, like I say, these meters have some really nice features. But I had a saved search for these meters. And so I've got three of them now. So, you know, that gives me a working one, a spare, and a spare for my spare. I'm one of those people, yeah, even if you have a spare, you have to have a spare for the spare. Because you never know. <laughs> but I figured three, okay, is enough. I don't need to be actively looking for these things anymore. And what did I see? More of these for sale. So, yeah, I actually got... <laughs> several more of them so yeah i've got i've got a growing collection here um so i thought we'd actually tear into at least one of these uh they both came from the the same seller um without power cords so the power cords have been whacked off and usually when this person sells stuff i i get the feeling actually this it has a number on the side of it one the other and the other meters have numbers have other numbers on the side i get the feeling a lot of the stuff that he sells comes from uh either technical schools or colleges or, you know, old Votech type programs, but they were used in schools and they just cut the cords off of everything because everything he ever sells never has a cord on it. It's always whacked off, which as a cover your butt from a seller standpoint, that's the best way to do it because with the cord being cut off uh, as a buyer, anytime you get something that has a cord missing, red flags there might be something wrong. Now, very, there may very well be nothing wrong with this multimeter, but that anytime you see the cord cut off of something, that should make you take a really, really hard look at it internally, you know, electronically. Is there something seriously wrong with it? You don't just want to go shoving a brand new cord on there and plug it in. The chassis might be hot. There could be other problems. You may let the magic smoke out, <laughs> which is usually not a good thing. So... I figured we'd actually take a look at the, one of these um, and see what and if it needs anything. Now, I know I'm going to replace the electrolytic capacitors in it. They're old. It's just like a radio. Um, electrolytic capacitors go bad and stuff like this. No different than a, a stereo receiver or a transceiver or anything else. So, you know, the caps are going to get changed. But really need to take a close look at it. Uh, now, the first thing we need to see, as with anything electronic... Now, these actually have two fuses. There's an external fuse, and then there's an internal slow blow fuse. But always check, being the cords cut off or not, the first thing you want to check on anything that plugs into a wall, before you plug it in, even if it's sold as working, still don't plug it in. Always check to see if the fuse is the proper rating. You'd be surprised how many times, now maybe not with test equipment, but especially radios, you'll see something that, you know, let's say it calls for a one and a quarter amp fuse or a three amp fuse. You know, if it needs a three amp fuse, don't be surprised if you find a 20 amp fuse in a fuse holder because it kept blowing a fuse and some nitwit decided, well, we'll just stick a bigger fuse in there, then it won't blow. Yeah, well, that kind of defeats the purpose of the fuse then. That fuse is meant to protect whatever it's it's installed in. If you stick a bigger fuse in there, eventually the parts start burning up inside. So, let's see what we got here. It should be a one and a quarter amp 3AG fuse. And it does not look like a 3AG fuse. It is a... Yeah, that's a... What is that? 3 amp. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, it's a 3AG, but it's a 3-amp fuse. That definitely the wrong size. So, yeah, first indicator, that's got to go. It's supposed to be one and a quarter amp. Um, so, let's pop the covers off of this critter. 
And one of the nice things about these other ones that I got here, um, and it's something to be aware of when you're buying you know, older stuff, meters like this especially, all the BK equipment that was made in this era had plastic end caps. So yeah, just kind of look at, you know, condition-wise when you're buying this kind of stuff to, uh, you know, make sure that the, the plastic's not broken or at least try to be aware of if it is or not, you know. If it is broken, how bad is it? Does it look like it can be fixed? Because <laughs> it's not like you can run down to the local store or it's not like you can pick up the phone and call BK Precision and say, hey, I need an end panel for my you know, BK290 multimeter. So just something to be aware of. Yeah, well, it's been modified. And what in God's name do we have here? That is not supposed to be there. <laughs> I know what these meters are supposed to have inside. So like I say, I just rebuilt that one. Uh, that fuse looks correct. So there's the, the slow blow fuse that should be in here. This, I don't know what in God's name... do they have going here? So they put that fuse... It's a fuse, I know that, but they put it in series with the one on the fuse holder. What the heck? I'm assuming these are caps. Maybe not. Ah, yep, they're caps. Jumping Jiminy Crickets. I gotta take this screw off here. Jesus, tight end caps. What in the world do we have here? This is a HVW4. Oh my god, there's a 4 amp fuse. <laughs> yeah, that's again not right. Why why is there a 4 amp fuse? They've got what what I say this was 3 amp. Yeah, they have a 3 amp fuse in this fuse holder. And you can see the yellow wire goes right down to the back of this fuse holder in series with a 4 amp fuse. And it's supposed to be one and a quarter amp fuse. Yeah, that's a uh, trash can. Yeah, I, <laughs> I have no idea why they did that. They're definitely not right. This fuse holder is just going to go bye-bye. This will be getting put back to factory original. Um, so let's tear this apart a little bit more. Now, cosmetically, this meter is in pretty good condition. It's got a little bit of a scratch across the meter face. If I get the reflection, just kind of see it. There is a scratch across there. So I will buff the lens on this. Um, I'm going to take the meter movement out of it anyhow. Then I can just pop the lens off of it. I can take it out and hit that on a Baldor buffer, and I just buff, you know, buff that scratch away. Um, both of these meters... I think it was both of them. Yep, that one's bent too. <laughs> I don't know if somebody whacked both of these meters right on this control, but the front panel's actually buckled in. You see that control, how it's slightly sideways. It's kind of bowed in a little bit. And it's also kind of bowed up. <laughs> I don't know if maybe these were dropped at a some kind of weird angle, but yeah, that shouldn't be too bad to get out. That should be just a matter of take this control loose, pull it out, take a pair of flat jaw high leverage pliers and just squeeze basically to flatten the sheet metal back out and then I can stick the control in because the controls seem to turn fine so as long as they're not damaged no need to replace them but uh yeah I don't I just I don't understand that the fuse situation there why <laughs> what well, it's bad enough you put a too big a fuse in it to start with but then to me you put another fuse in series with it. Yeah, I, that kind of dumbfounded by that. This fuse would never blow. I mean, this is a 3 amp fuse. It's an amp lower than this one. Yeah, I, it got me. And, and one thing, if you ever do get one of these meters, I usually do it to mine. Uh, because I'm usually using, well, not usually, always. I'm always using this style meter on a bench. I don't need this blasted handle. Um, sometimes that can be, you know, that little bit of extra width there can be the difference between being able to shove it into a crack or a crevice 
actually. Kind of like that one right there. It wouldn't fit where it's at right now with the handle on it. But I always take the handles off, and these are easy to get off. They just have Eclipse on them. So that's no biggie. I can easily get rid of the, uh, of the handle. But yeah, I always pop those off. And then I always try to, anytime I take handles off, like even carrying handles on the top of equipment, uh, when I take the handles off, you put a, something, a cap plug or a piece of tape over the hole, just something maybe to keep dust bunnies from getting inside of your equipment. Okay. And not only that, it makes assembling these meters a little bit easier, because you can see that's actually kind of what holds this thing together. Yeah, it's, it can be a little pain in the butt trying to get these things put back together. Okay. Now, I don't think I showed the inside. Oh, no, my, my tested sticker fell off. I'll actually glue that back on. Yeah, keep the, you know, the history of the meter. So, inspector number, what was it, nine? Inspector number nine passed this meter. But uh, I, had sh I had said in the other video, I explained the circuit and I showed it on the schematic, so I don't need to repeat myself there. But I had mentioned about... These meters, if you look on the schematic, and if you watch the video I did on the other one, I explained about the schematic calls for a neon bulb right here. They don't have, I've never, ever seen one that had a neon bulb. Every single meter I've ever seen had a regular incandescent light bulb with this resistor that's supposed to be in here, but this is a different value. But this resistor would normally be down on the board, and both of the leads for the neon bulb would come down to this board. This bulb is in series because it's incandescent. It's actually in series with the, one of the main power with the power supply rail in this thing right after the bridge rectifier. I think it was and it was a CSA, you know, basically a modification for CSA or government contract stuff. I think the reason they did that was they're using the light bulb not as a fuse because uh, you have to remember a light bulb can only pass so much current. It, but it won't blow. You have to remember, as the filament heats up, that's what when a bulb when a bulb starts to glow, it can only get to a certain point. It doesn't matter how much more load is applied. Let's say on the other other side of that bulb, it will never glow brighter, so it will never allow more current to pass than a dead short. You know, if you were to take the other lead just straight to ground, well, that's the light bulb lighting. If you put the light bulb in in a series circuit with a power supply. It basically acts as a poor man's current limiting circuit, and I think that's why they did that. But yeah, like I say, the schematic shows a neon bulb with this as, an, as a modification for CSA contracts, but I've never seen one that didn't have this. <laughs> so, and some people think this is, yeah, something somebody did. No, no, this is just the way they left the factory. This, this was factory. Um, so, otherwise, inside, it's not looking... Like it's ever been worked on. All original electrolytic capacitors. And there's actually the trimmer that I had to replace in the other one. A f yeah, oddball size. It's a 5 mega ohm. And you can see, like I had said in that one, like I said, I had that meter closed up. I wish I'd have shown it uh, when it was apart. But yeah, these have the really big quarter lot um, trimmer potentiometers in them. But yeah, nothing, nothing looking too out of the ordinary other than that fuse. Let me just pop the meter movement loose. Well, like I say, the main reason I need to take that out is because I want to buff the lens. And I don't want to do that in the meter, or while it's you know, still assembled in here. Here's something. There's something loose. It's got to be inside the meter movement. Oh, it just fell out. What was it? Did some? Oh, it's a piece of the lens. <laughs> okay, I heard a piece of plastic bouncing around in here. It's got to be off the. Yep, right there. It's actually off this back corner. So yeah, I can actually get that just glued back on. Okay. Need to take out the last two screws here. And 
Let's see, to fully get this out. Because I actually didn't take the other one this far apart. <laughs> so I'm actually... These don't have set screws, do they? No, they just push on. I have to take the nuts off. So you can just see there's a scratch going across there. Matter of fact, you can see a shadow on the meter face there. There you can had it some, one play. You can see it pretty good there. Yeah, that should easily buff out. And that little corner that's broken off, I'll just glue. I can glue that back on. But uh, yeah, and these meter lenses, they just pop on. You can see there's a couple little fingers there. Usually get your fingernail in there. You know, just pry out slightly on the lens, and the lenses just pop off. Just be really careful once you get the lens off. Try not to touch the meter face or the needle. If you touch the meter face, yeah, it'll look fine today. may look fine next year, but five or ten years down the road, you have to remember most of these meter faces, the back, you know, the actual part right here that's white, it's aluminum. And if you touch it, the oils from your finger will eventually soak through the paint. The oil will start to oxidize the aluminum and your paint will start to flake off of your meter face. So anytime you have one of these apart, never ever touch the meter face. Now if it's, you know, needs to be clean, yeah, clean it, but like I say, just don't touch it with your bare hands. There's all kinds of nasty salts and oils in your hands that do nasty things to metal. So, well, you can see the inside of it. close-up look here. Mm, I don't see anything burned up. Don't think anything has ever been replaced, like I say. It looks original, with the exception of that fuse holder. There's no... Doesn't look like anything's ever been re-soldered on the main board here. So, yeah. So yeah, all I need to do basically is take this off. Um, wait a minute. What do, oh, okay, yeah, that is supposed to go down there because that's yeah, that's for the that yeah, that's the fuse for the jack for your meter. Yeah, that's man, that's just why did they do that? Put such a large fuse. I just don't understand why they because <coughs> this is the fuse here. For your power cord, okay? You know, so if you had a dead short in here in the power supply circuit, this fuse would blow. This fuse is actually the one that protects your meter, uh, the inputs. Because that, as you can see, it's attached to the fuse holder there. Yeah, I just, I don't know why, why they put such high values on there. It just really doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, got me. <laughs> so... Yeah, that'll have to go. Um, oh, and just in case you've never seen one, don't see them in a lot of stuff. This is a spark gap capacitor. So you can see that little line. Well, it's not... A, get some light here. It's not actually a line. There's actually a gap. Uh, I'm trying to get the light behind it. But that's actually a cut straight through the capacitor. There, you can just see some of the aluminum behind it. If I get the angle just right, you can actually see the gap through there. They're called spark gap capacitors because that's actually what they do. If you get enough voltage on this thing, so, you know, and they're rated, the way they rate spark gap capacitors, you know, when they're using them in a circuit like this, whatever the maximum voltage it's allowed at the input here, so, you know, in the case of this meter, it's 1,500 volts DC or 4,200 volts peak-to-peak -peak AC voltage, you know, and then there's a, there's a margin there. The meter can actually handle more than that. It may not be able to be read on the, on the, the meter itself, but, you know, this, the, the circuit inside the, the multimeter can handle it a little bit above that, 
but once you get to a certain point, that will arc. That will arc over, and that's what that's meant to do. It's meant to basically, because and once it arcs, that's a short, you know, because it's now arcing from one terminal to the next. So it basically dead shorts your positive and negative leads together, protecting the high voltage from blowing up your multimeter. <laughs> You know, now, you might smoke your test leads <laughs> because now you've created a dead short outside of the meter. But that's basically what, you know, it's mainly, the, I think the main reason they use those is is more for surge. If there were a surge in a circuit, you know, an instantaneous surge for a very short duration, that thing can go, bzzz, it can short it, it can absorb that voltage spike without damaging the meter. Um, like I say, it's just meant to protect your meter. So, yeah, it looks pretty good. So let me get, uh, there's only a couple um, capacitors in this thing. As you can see, you got one, two, three aluminum electrolytics there. And I think there's, what, three? I can't remember. It's two or three tantalums. There's one there. Uh, I'm pretty sure there was more than one. I thought I changed two or three when I did that other one. I'm trying to look around the camera, it didn't help. Oh, actually, there's a, another spark gap capacitor. You can see, and there you can just see the wires behind it in that position right there. So there's another one with the, the line through it. But yeah, I, I just, that fuse just gets me. I, I don't know what, what they were doing there. Strange, strange, strange. Oh, there it is. There's another one right there. So yeah, one, two. There's two tantalums, a little blue one. Now, honestly, these would probably be fine, but <laughs> uh, the problem with tantalum capacitors is when they go bad, they base, unlike electrolytics like this, aluminum electrolytics, when they go bad, they can go bad in two ways, either an open or a short. In either case, that usually happens over a really, really long time. Usually, you'll start to notice degraded performance in whatever you're using, uh, before it actually becomes a dead short. Tantalum capacitors aren't like that. They'll be fine one second, and they're a dead short the next. And that's pretty much a tantalum capacitor's failure mode is a dead short. Unlike an aluminum electrolytic, it can go open. Yeah, these things, when they fail, they pretty much ju just go dead short. Um, and when I, anytime I replace tantalum capacitors, I always increase the voltage rating on them. So, you know, if it's a let's say a 16 volt, I'll stick in like a 25 or a 35 or even a 50 volt um, tantalum capacitor to give it a little bit more safety margin there. Because honestly, just like with radios, even, even meter manufacturers, a lot of times you'll see tantalum capacitors. Um, and some of the old fluke and HP meters, you can see that. You know, they have the uh, tantalum capacitors will short out and cause problems in the meter. And they just run them so close to their actual operating voltage that the things are just, yeah, they're straining from the from day one. So, yeah, they don't, nowadays, tantalum capacitors, yes, they are expensive, but they're not, it's not like they're super expensive like they were back in the day. So, yeah, you can afford, besides that, there's only two of them in here. Just get a, a cup, one or two voltage ratings higher. Um, save yourself some headache in the future. So, there you go. Yeah, I'm... I'm feeling good about this one. Doesn't look like the the meter. Another thing to look at when you're looking at multimeters like this, the meter contacts. Make sure you know none of the uh, contact fingers down in there are blown off, or there's damage, or any of these wafers. And these wafer switches are actually broken. Um, usually, if they're broken, you'll be able to tell when you turn the controls. You'll get to a point it just won't turn anymore. And if you ever get a, a rotor, uh, a wafer switch like this in something. Doesn't matter if it's test equipment. Anything that has multi-positions, older stuff, is usually going to have wafer switches like this. If you turn it and you get to a point where it won't turn anymore, and it's supposed to, don't force it. <laughs> Very good chance you could really break the switch. Take it apart and look at it and see what's binding the switch up before you go breaking the switch. So, in any case, let me get some caps changed. Um, I just need to check this the fuse wiring on the schematic. Um, like I say, put that back to factory the way it's supposed to be. Um, I, I just am confused by that. That weird, this double, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can understand using a high quality fuse on the input like this, but not that high of a rating. Like I say, that's four amps. Just, I, I don't get that. Um, oh, and you can see the chassis a little bit bent right there. 
So I'll just pop this control loose. Like I said, I can just take, and this is aluminum, so it's very malleable. So that'd be easy to get bent back in shape. Um, and then I can uh, stick a paracord on this thing, and uh, we'll see how she works. Now, uh, one thing to remember, just like I said with the other meter, uh, the probes on these, actually, just reach over and pull the probe down for this one. It's attached to the meter over there. Uh, the probes that are came with these meters were the PR21s. Now, you don't have to have this probe. If you get a meter like this, or any old, old meter, matter of fact, there's lots of YouTube videos, people showing how to make probes. There's nothing special inside of this thing. All that's inside of this switch housing is a switch and a 100K or 100,000 ohm resistor. That's it. That's all that's in there. When you put it in direct, it just goes from the tip down to the positive jack. When you put it in the 100K position like that, it adds the 100K resistor in series between the probe tip and the positive. That's it. That's all there's in there. It's not like there's any fancy circuitry. It's not an RF type probe, so there's no diodes, there's no capacitors, there's no, you know, no demodulation circuit in here. It's just a resistor. Worst case scenario, you could always just get two, you know, if you needed to make up a set of test leads, you only need a negative to go in here. For your positive, you know, for your DC with the 100k ohm resistor, all you would need to do is just take a meter probe and just literally just stick a 100k ohm resistor in circuit. You can get the, uh, you know, the long meter leads. Uh, let's see if I got test lead probes. I can get the drawer out. Oh, come on. Bear with me a second. Pull out one of my scrap test lead drawers here. Uh, let's see if I can find something. Yeah. You can still get probes like this, cheapies. You know, this is an old one, but you can get stuff like this. Um, and in this style, if you can get the body, this one, yeah, this was, oh, okay, this one you actually, yeah, which is actually kind of, this is a unique probe, actually, I forgot, this is, this is actually kind of a rare one, has, has an extendable tip, yeah, but anyhow, what you could do is on when you're building a probe, I actually pulled that out of there. Yeah. Now, Grant, most of them aren't going to have this. is actually a bad example because normally it's not going to be like this. This piece would only be about that long. It would be up in there. And the rest of the tube's hollow. You could just stick your resistor, you know, solder it in here, or in this case, it has a set screw, which I don't like for probes, actually. Uh, screw connections can fail at some point. But just put your resistor in there and then solder your actual test lead to the other end of the resistor. And then that becomes your DC probe. Now for the AC probe, it's actually a good idea to try and and do what they did at the factory for this meter. Um, you'll notice this cable's really heavy. It's coax cable. They do that for shielding. Because this meter, now it's not like that other multimeter I have that can do take accurate measurements up to like what 720 megahertz and it's usable well out past a gigahertz it's just not accurate over 720 megahertz you can't do that with you can't measure volt your at frequency ac frequencies that high with a meter like this it's fairly low i think this one's good to like a megahertz or something i'd actually have to pull the manual and see but um it's just something to to remember when you do that, when you make up a probe, it's a good idea to use coax cable for the AC probe if you plan on measuring at, at you know in a in a frequency range because especially at low voltages, if you get any leakage in through your cable, that can affect your meter reading. Um, and it's not hard; you can just get some of the uh, the cables that actually have the double banana plugs. You can make your own. Just get the double banana plugs. Uh, let's see here. Uh, gotta figure out which wall I got those probes hanging on. Oh, where are they at? Where in the heck are all my double bananas at? Actually, it doesn't even need to be that style. Oh, there's there's a pile of them. Oh, just buried. Come on, get out of there. Oh. One clip binding up 
here. So, as I was saying, <laughs> you can take something like this and turn it into, well, not all three of them, but you know, these they still make these today. You can get these, you can get them from Pomona and some other manufacturers. It's a double double banana. It's already molded, so you know, the center conductor is your goes to your positive, and then the ground side, which has the tab, any double banana plugs always have a little tab there. That indicates the ground side, that's the shield. You could make an AC probe out of one of these. Matter of fact, you could use this just like this as an AC probe, okay? Because it's shielded, you know. Right there, you go. That's that's really all you need. You know, you could take this off. Now, usually they come this is shorter. Um, you know, you can get, and you'll see that. See how that one's shorter, and this one's shorter. They do they do that to keep the lead length really short. Because once you get out of here, you have to remember it's not shielded anymore. So that's why they always keep this probe tip short. You know, but you could take this cable if you wanted to, just whack the end off if you wanted a little bit extra. Um, honestly, probably what I would do is if I were to take one of these and I wanted to convert it into a positive probe for something like this, what I would do is just cut the ground lead off. Okay, take a regular single banana plug you could shove that back in here as your ground lead so just like the ones that came with this meter it's a long separate lead and then on the end here then you could put your you know your regular probe tip but that way you know this that then becomes basically your ac probe your ground will be an, another jack that gets plugged in here you know you could leave very well leave it like this too but like i say that leaves you shielding that way you don't have to worry about outside, you know, signals interfering with your measurements. So, in any case, let me get uh, get some caps changed, do a little bit of work to this thing. We'll get it fired up and uh, see if any smoke comes out, which hopefully we don't. <laughs> okay, so she lives. As you can see, we have a little red light. That's always a good sign. <laughs> um... So I changed the electrolytic capacitors. Um, I didn't take this out to the shop and buff this on the Baldor buffer. Um, the scratches weren't that bad. I was actually able to just do that with a uh, headlight polishing buff ball sitting here at the bench. So I didn't have to go out in the shop and fire up the big big buffer. Um, it's still a little bit visible there. But you, you just want to be careful when you're buffing lenses. If you're using you know big power buffers <laughs> like the, the Baldor buffer I have. If you push too hard on something like that, it's really easy to just buff straight through the lens. It'll burn a hole through that thing in no time. Um, but anyhow, uh, cleaned the controls. I straightened up the sheet metal where it was you know, slightly bent. Like I say, it's aluminum that was very easy to get uh, flattened out. Uh, changed the three aluminum electrolytics, the two uh, tantalum electrolytic capacitors. Uh, cleaned the controls and the switches while, while I had it apart. Uh, took that crazy fuse modification. Yeah, I don't know what the heck they were doing with this thing, but yeah, that's been removed. Um, this fuse was not put back in. I put in a proper one and a quarter amp fuse, like it's supposed to have. Um, and obviously put a power cord on it. It's turned on, so <laughs> it has a proper power cord. Um, and fired it up. Light came on. Uh, flipped it to the ohms position. I saw the needle move, so hey, that's good there. Um, and I hooked up a probe. Uh, so I'm going to do the, the alignment on this. I think I'll go ahead, I'll get, let me get this stuff cleaned off the bench here a little bit. Um, I'll just go ahead and do the uh, calibration procedure, actually show you me doing the calibration procedure on this, because it's actually fairly simple. Um, it's only like, what, one and a half pages or something like that. There's not much to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, half of it's description over here, a little bit on the bias adjustment. And this page, and that's all there is. There's only what one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, six calibration pots. So we'll do that. Now, one thing to remember: if you have more than one meter, like like me, if you're a a hoarder <laughs> and you have several meters, when you do the calibration on a meter like this, make sure you're using the probe that is going to live with this meter for the DC portion, okay? You can use anything for the AC volts, the, the high, low ohms position, and the current. Uh, 
that's not that's not important. Doesn't matter what you know, because that's just straight through. The meter probe will be in the direct position for that. But when you're in the DC volts position, that has this hundred thousand uh, ohm or hundred k ohm resistor in series with this probe tip. So if you use another probe, you know, like this probe, I is calibrate. I use to calibrate that meter up there. So when I calibrated the other meter, that's what this probe goes to. It will stay with that meter. I just have it stuck in here because I'm easy to grab. Um, luckily, I have about a dozen of these things. No, they're not for sale. I got a lot of them one time. Uh, somebody was selling not meters. They just had a big bundle of these probes, and I scooped them up. <laughs> it got them for a couple dollars a piece. But like I say, just make sure you use the probe when you calibrate the DC, the DC voltmeter function on this meter that you're calibrating the meter using the probe that is going to stay with that meter. Because if you use another probe, the resistance, you know, even though it's 100K, it's, they're never going to be exactly the same. Even a precision resistor, you know, if you get like a 0.1% or a 0.05 or even a 0.01% resistor, still there's a tolerance in there. It's going to be slightly different than the resistance value that you'd find in, let's say, another probe. So make sure you're using the probe. It's going to stay with the meter, so I need to go dig. That's the other thing I need to do, go dig out another probe. Um, but like I say, it does work. So, you know, if we stick it to the ohms function there, I hope I didn't grab the fuse, grab the ground clip here, stick it in direct. Ah, as I drop it. Let's see, we go to zero. Zero works properly. Now, uh, it's actually part of the calibration. Come on, stay on there, little guy. It's part of the, the calibration. When you adjust the... Uh, part of the calibration is, you see how fast the needle swings there? Very, very little movement of the knob here. And that needle, whew, it's, so it, you know, it's like really hard. But watch as I turn. I'll get to a point, and it slows down. And I keep turning and turning and turning. And you have very little movement. See how small, there's a very small amount of movement there. And then once I get up to a certain point, it just did very little movement, and you have a lot of needle swing. That's actually part of the calibration, is setting that slow zone, <laughs> if you want to call it that. You want that slow zone down here, because you don't want the tiniest bump of that thing to be moving that needle a lot. You want it so you can get a really fine adjustment when you're down here. It's very sensitive to set it to zero. And that was actually one thing with that other meter. When I went to do the calibration on that one, uh, it looked like somebody had, I guess, tried to do an alignment on it. Remember that one had the broken uh, trimmer potentiometer, potentiometer in it. Um, but someone had screwdrivered at that one and the slow zone was like way up here. And once you got to a certain point, the needle got the needle swing was really fast again. With you know a tiny bit of movement, you had a lot of needle swing, which makes it very hard to set it exactly at zero. So that's what you want is this. So it's just like that, where it's just a little bit of movement barely moves the needle. Because if you get it up here like this, yeah, it just it moves such a tiny little. You can just see I'm barely turning that thing. How much swing you get. Um, so let me get set up for the uh, alignment. Uh, you don't need a lot. I mean, you do need some, um, need an AC signal generator, you know, DC voltage source. Um, you know, like I say, you do need a couple things to set it. But yeah, there's not a lot to doing one of these. Um, of course, you're going to want to have something to reference this to when you do your adjustments. So, you know, I'll be using a multimeter that has a laboratory calibration. That meter right there, that one's been laboratory calibrated. Um, and it's still in calibration. So I'll be using that as my reference standard. Uh, now, you know, in the real world, should you be doing that? Well, yeah, it's not exactly the best thing because you're using a meter that's been calibrated and you're using that to calibrate something else. And of course, there's going to always be error every time you do something like that. And that would be like taking this meter and using this as a reference standard to calibrate another meter. But there's one thing to remember here. This is an old analog meter. That is a, like that meter right there is a five and a half digit meter. I've got four and a half digit. That's a five and a half. I also have six and a half digit meters. That meter is several orders of magnitude more accurate than this meter. You know, even in, now this one does have a fairly low position. It has, what is that? 50 millivolt. It does have a 50 millivolt scale, but still 
that meter has several orders of magnitude better resolution than this meter. So I'm perfectly fine. Not saying, honestly, I, I doubt you could find a, a, a cow lab that would calibrate a meter like this. They'd look at you and go, what are you, nuts? Why don't you just do it yourself? But, uh, yeah, like I said, just make sure that whatever you're using for your reference standard uh, is accurate. Uh, if you have a calibrated voltage source, hey, that's great. You know, if you've got a voltage calibrator, you've got calibration standards, hey, that's even better. But yeah, just using, just make sure whatever you're using is accurate because the last thing you want to do is, is calibrate something and you're calibrating it out of calibration because what you're using is your standard isn't correct. So let me get set up and I'll be back. Oh, last, a uh, few couple other quick things. Occasionally I'll get people will ask me in emails. Uh, now you saw the nuts for that are behind, like behind these knobs, those are just hex nuts. So, you know, nothing but a nut driver or a socket or a wrench. They're easy to get off. But this, the nuts on these knobs here, you can see they're knurled. They're perfectly round. <laughs> There's no flat sides. And people often ask, how do you get those things off without scratching up the faceplate and gouging those nuts? Because they're usually using something like this, a pair of pliers to try and get in there because you can't use a nut driver on it. There is actually a tool for that. And that's what this is. Okay. And you can see it's a collet. It's got four jaws. Kind of hard to see in there. But you can see it's got serrated teeth on the inside edge. And then as you move this, that tightens it up. This is actually what you use. And you can see it's very deep. This is what you use to install and take those nuts off. Um... This one's made by who? Walsco, which I'm not even sure if they're in business anymore. I've got two or three of these. I mean, I actually have them in three different sizes. But if I'm not mistaken, I think GC Electronics still sells. I don't know if they sell the smaller sizes anymore, but I think GC Electronics still sells this size here, the large size. So, yeah, if you go to GC Electronics, they have all kinds of nifty little widgets for doing electronics work. But, yeah, this is the proper tool for taking off and installing those nuts. Um, the other thing is when you're doing cord strain reliefs, I, I see this a lot myself. <laughs> I'll be working on something and the strain relief right here, this plastic strain relief, it looks like an angry groundhog installed it. I mean, they're just because they used those you know slip joint pliers like I just had. They're usually using something like this to take those things in and out. And it just mars the heck out of those things. Again, there's a proper tool for doing that. If you're going to be doing a lot of electronics work where you're going to be replacing a lot of cords, get yourself a pair of strain relief pliers. That's what these things are made for. You know, they have offset handle. That's what they're made for doing. Removing and installing those strain reliefs, okay? I think these were made by Heiko, or not Heiko, Heiko, H-E, God, I'd have to look it up. I've got, well, let me just turn around. Let's see, cord strain reliefs. No. Oh. Volt Voltrex. I would have had it wrong. It's SPC Technologies actually who makes it, but yeah, Voltrex is the company. And that's the, the strain reliefs that I actually use. But yeah, you know, like I say, there um, there is a proper tool for doing it. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, you use the proper voltmeters when you're saying when you you're working on a radio. When it comes to mechanical stuff, it's no different. There's proper mechanical tools for doing mechanical things. So, in any case, let me get set up here, and we'll get back and uh, do the alignment. Like I say, it only takes a couple minutes. It's very simple. So, let me get set up. Okay, so like I said, you need to keep uh, the probe that you're going to use with one of these meters, especially if you want to take accurate DC voltage measurements, try to keep the probe, you know, with the meter. <laughs> so if you have more than one, you should have two probes. So, you know, like in the case of this one, there's that meter, and you can see the probes attached to it. Same with this one. Like I say, now I'm lucky. I got you know, a stockpile of these things. So, uh, but I like to rebuild. You know, if you're going to restore your meter, you might as well restore, it's slightly out of view here, restore your probe at the same time. So, you know, check it over too. Does it need any maintenance? Um, you know, this one didn't have a boot on the ground clip. And yeah, it looked like the same groundhog, you know, that might be chewing on something probably did the soldering job on this one. Now, you know, this was the original clip because it is a Mueller good, you know, high quality 60 series clip. But yeah, it's seen better days. So, you know, put a new good clip on it. Don't get, just take my word for it. Avoid Chinese alligator clips 
like the plague, the Black Plague. <laughs> Stay away from them. They won't do anything but piss you off. <laughs> I speak from experience. Invest in good Mueller brand clips. That's what this is. So this is exactly the same clip. Just a, a brand new one. It's a Mueller 60 series cl clamp. Get the Mueller boots, too. Again, don't use cheap Chinese ones. These are good and flexible. Um, you know, and instead of doing a soldering job that looks like a, you know, maybe a two-year-old hacked at it, you know, do a good soldering job. You know, you can't even see the hole there. It's perfectly smooth. You know, where normally there'd be this little hole back here where the wire goes through. See, it's perfectly filled in, nice and smooth. You know, clean off your flux residue. But, you know, once that's done, slide the boot on there. Now it's good for another, you know, 30 plus years. <laughs> um, the probe itself, there's not much really you need to do to this. I just kind of do this preventive maintenance. Uh, I do replace the uh, 100K resistor that's inside of it. So, you know, here's the original one that was in there. That, you know, carbon film. I put in a higher uh, quality one, a higher precision resistor, and this is a metal film. But, yeah, just stick, st I stick a new resistor in there. And, but there, you can see what's inside the probe. Not much to speak of. There's a switch, like I said, and a resistor. That's it. Nothing else. That's all there is. So uh, let me get this screw back together, get this stuff put away, um, get some other equipment turned on here, and we can do the uh, calibration procedure on this. Okay, so I think I got <clears throat> everything set up here that I need for uh, to do the calibration I've got uh, my power supply set up already actually power supply uh, the, the voltmeter that I'm going to be using to check that you know the power supply and my voltages that I'm going to be using to set this are correct um, got an AC signal generator turned on already um, so let's jump into it so let's grab the book here very important always have <laughs> have your cal have your owner's manual, and in this case, owner's and maintenance manual. Um, first thing we need to do is uh, connect an external voltmeter, which we'll be using that one back there, between the positive meter terminal. So what they're talking about are the two terminals on the back of the meter. You're going to connect from the positive meter terminal and the common ground, or the foil ground, uh, of the circuit board. So not the ground terminal on the meter. You're going to attach the positive to the positive lead on the meter and the negative to the actual negative, uh, the big trace on you, basically the back of the circuit board. Uh, set the zero control so the meter pointer rests over the zero mark. So down here, uh, zero mark and adjust the bias adjustment R53 so that the external meter reads 6.5 volts. So let's do that. Some alligator clips on here. Oh, and I hate working around cameras. Uh, yeah, that's ground. So I pick up ground right there. And the positive terminal. And yeah, that's a tad bit. If we come back into focus. Focus, focus, focus. Yeah. 9.5 volts. So that's way too high. So we need to adjust R53. I say we, I mean me. <laughs> ah, R53. That is the second pot. Remember, we needed to check, make sure. Actually, we're just slightly off a of zero there. And now when you look at it, uh, yeah, at a camera, it's off a little bit, but you have to remember the camera is off and to the right a little bit. Unless you're with an analog meter movement, remember, your viewing angle is very important if you want to take really accurate measurements with, a, with an analog meter. Because as you can see, as I tilt the meter down, you can see the needle looks like it's way off a of zero now. And if you go in the opposite direction, you tilt the meter back, it's going to look like it's the other direction. So when you're viewing a, an analog meter, you want to make sure basically your eyeball is dead in front of the needle on the scale that you're looking at, especially when you're doing a calibration. Okay, R53. And we're going to adjust for 6.5 volts. Oop, wrong way. Okay, 
So that's good. And just remember, when you're working on this meter, there is 120 volts alive in the back of this thing, so watch where you're putting your fingers. We don't want anybody getting electrocuted. Uh, next step, balance. Balance adjustments must be set to obtain the following results. Slowest meter movement of meter pointer through zero at left end of meter when zero control is rotated. So like I was saying, when we rotate this control, oop, just turned it off. When we rotate this control, you can see it gets really fast up the top end. You want it really slow, yeah, and it's like, it's off a little bit. Especially now that we've adjusted the, the balance or the bias adjustment on there. Yeah, it's not really slow down here anymore. It's slow, like, right here, <laughs> which is not close to zero. Uh, an indication of 0.3 or higher on the 0 to 0.5 volt scale with the zero control set fully clockwise. So, you know, like that. And it's, yeah, it's now way, which is it's fine, 0.3 or higher, so that's actually fine. So the actual adjustment... Uh, adjust the balance adjustment, set the range switch to 1500 volts, so 1500 volts. Function switch to DC positive, it is. Balance adjustment to halfway, balance adjustment side one there, or 51. Uh, right about there is halfway. Uh, rotate zero control to half rotation. And there's actually a little tiny imperfection in the little rubber boot on this thing. So I know approximately where zero is, or centered is. So there's centered. Uh, half rotation and readjust the balance adjustment until the meter reads zero. Pull in here. Ah, is there anything with tremor pots? <laughs> they seem to jump on you. Turn a little too hard and it just jumps a little too far. Okay, zero. Now, uh, rotate the zero control fully clockwise. Okay. And meter pointer must indicate 0.3 or higher on the zero to 0.5 volt scale. So the zero to 0.5 volt scale, we can see there's our 0.5, so the second scale. There's 0.3, and we're definitely higher than that. We're like 0.44. I'll take those two pages out of there. You keep falling out of my book. Readjust the zero control for zero and closely observe the meter pointer through zero at left end of meter scale. The pointer movement appears to be too rapid. Adjust the balance adjustment to obtain slowest movement of pointer through zero. So like I say, we want the slow movement. You can see it's really fast up here. And then it starts to slow down, slow down. And yeah, it's nice and slow down here at the zero. So that looks good. Okay, next step, we're going to be adjusting the minus DC volts. Uh, first check the setting, the mechanical zero. So they have, there's mechanical and electrical zero. Mechanical zero is you turn the meter off and you adjust the adjustment here in the center so the needle rests on zero, which I've already done. So turn the meter back on. Um, actually, I need to zero it now. It's actually still, still right on zero. Set the range switch to the 500 millivolt range. And the function switch to minus. Set the probe switch to the 100K position, because anytime you use this meter in DC volts, the probe switch needs to be in the 100K ohm position. And apply exactly 0.5 volts DC to the input terminals and adjust the DC, negative DC cow pot, R45, for exactly 0.5 on the meter, on the 0 to 0.5 volt scale. So again, we want to double check, make sure we're on 0. We are. Going to check. 
the external meter just to check our and you can see we're 0.49927 so we're within a few thousandths of a volt and I'll attach the meter now so I'm hooking up because remember we're in the negative so that means the red lead <laughs> the, the negative lead right here is going to go to your positive because this is the positive when you have the meter set to minus DC volts and this is the negative and yes we're definitely off scale so we want to adjust the minus DC cal or 45 We're on the second scale, we're adjusting for that 0.5, and there we go, 0.5 volts, and positive DC volts calibration, set to, set to function switch to positive DC volts, uh, apply again the same 0.5 volts DC to the input terminal and adjust CalPot R46 for exactly 0.5 volts. So that is, let's see, that's the outside one. Disconnect my probes, switch to positive DC, recheck zero, good. So anytime you ever change anything, your function switches or your range switch, always check your zero. And, well, that one's fairly close, but it is off a little bit. Okay, 0.5 volts. Okay, so actually I can turn off this noisy power supply over here because we're done with the DC volts. So next, we're going to be doing the AC volts calibration. First check the setting in a mechanical zero. I've already done that. Uh, <coughs> AC volts. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're... we're the, like I say, the only time you use the 100K position is when you're in DC voltage range or mode. So we're, we're going to be AC volts, so we need to go direct. We want to... Whoa, my little critter there almost rolls off the bench. We want to connect the clip, short it out. Because remember, AC voltage, especially when you get into low range there, you can see, you know, touching the probe, just touching the probe with my fingertip, yeah, it pegs the needle because it's very sensitive. And I'm going to check for zero. Good. Okay. And we want to go to, what, the 0.5 volt range. Uh, yep. And we're going to apply 0.5 volts RMS. Just, we're going to apply 0.5 volts RMS sine wave at 60 hertz to the input terminals and adjust the AC cal pot for a 0.5 indication on the meter. 0 to 0.5 scale. <clears throat> so, and just so we can see that, we'll flip this meter over to AC. Get my alligator clips back in here. So this is attached to the signal generator up there. So I've got them attached to that meter back there. So you can see there's point, point 0.5 volts, or 500 millivolts RMS. We're now going to take that and attach that to our probe here. This camera tripod really just gets in the way. Okay. And we want to adjust R39 so it reads 0.5 volts. R39 is what? One, two, three over. And we're going we're measuring AC volts RMS, so that's this top red scale.
Okay, right there. Okay, so I can turn the signal generator off now. Okay, and the last thing to set is our ohms function. Uh, high ohms calibration, you want to set the function switch to the low ohms position. Uh, range switch to times 100. Set the probe switch to direct, which it already is. Short the test leads together and zero the meter with the zero here. Okay, zeroed, and then you want to disconnect the clips and adjust the ohms setting for infinity. It's a little sign right there, the infinity. Okay. Zero control for exactly zero on the left-hand scale, and then open the test leads and adjust the control for exactly infinity at the right-hand side of the meter scale. And now we need to switch the function switch to the high ohms position. And without touching the ohms control, adjust the high ohms cal pot so the meter reads exactly infinity. So basically what you're doing is you've got infinity there. And then when you switch to the high ohms position, it should read exactly the same, which it's not. And that is the one... I don't know if I can get this. <laughs> Camera's probably going to be in my way. That's the adjustment that's way down in there when this thing's... I'm trying to look down in around the camera here. Got it. Okay, right there. So we should all be all calibrated up and this meter is ready to go. We can actually take, where is the resistor? Actually the one that I took out of the probe, right there. We can actually check that. Actually I'd need to go to the, let's say about the 10K range. Zero the meter. Disconnect the probe. Infinity, okay, and you have to do that anytime you change ranges, you're going to want to make sure you, like I say, anytime you change anything, you want to check your zero, and if you're in the ohms function, you're going to want to set your zero and then also adjust the ohms control for infinity with the probes disconnected. And then the way you read the scale on one of these meters is there's two scales, or there's the ohm, not two scale, there's two scales for the voltage scales, but for the ohm scale. It's the top scale up here. It goes from zero to infinity. So what you do is, whatever the number the needle is resting on there, you multiply that by whatever you have the switch set to. We have it, so we have it set to the 10K or 10,000 ohms position. And this is a 100, 100K or 100,000 ohm resistor. And you can see the needle... Hold them. Come on, stay on there, little guy. You can see we're dead nuts on on 10k there, so 10 times 10k is 100k, which is what that resistor is. So there was nothing wrong with this resistor. Like I say, I just like to. That's probably the hardest working part in this meter because that's the one thing that's you know, especially if you're doing uh, a lot of DC voltage measurements, that thing can be taking some hits. So yeah, I just like to change that. But uh, there you go. So like I say, the the calibration procedure on these meters is fairly simple. Uh, you just need a 500 millivolt or, you know, 0.5 volt DC uh, voltage source. And you need uh, an AC power source also at 0.5 or 500 millivolts. Uh, and on the AC, it needs to be sine wave um, at 60 hertz. As long as you have that, that's really all you need to calibrate one of these things. It's very simple. 
Um, they're very reliable meters, you know, fairly easy to work on. Um, like I say, the only, the only thing is when you're working on these, when you're it's not so much taking them apart, but when you put these back together, don't tighten down really hard on any screws. Any of these screws that go that are attached to these plastic end caps, you can see what's actually holding. Let me turn off my AC power supply over there, so I'm not. Let's see if I can get one of these pulled out. These little clips. Uh, my metal screwdriver. Probably one of those little critters out of the slot. But these little clips, okay, and that's what the screws bite into. But if you tighten down on any screw in here too tight, you're going to break these plastic ears. And <laughs> then that's that's what holds the meter together. So, yeah, just just snug. It doesn't need to be, you know, you don't need to be King Kong when you put this thing together. It's going to be sitting on a workbench. It's not like you're going to be, you know, launching this thing into outer space. So, yeah, just be gentle, especially, like I say, it's plastic. It's old, and, of course, plastic gets more and more brittle as time goes on. So, just snug down the screws and you'll have a good working meter that should last you decades to come and you know once a year just check the calibration just like any instrument um, once a year check your calibration and as long as everything you know you'll be able to do that without even having to take the, the meter off of your shelf or whatnot you can just check the the resistance uh, like I say low high power function it shouldn't move off of the infinity symbol there it should be it should stay exactly the same for both high and low power ohms um, Check your DC and AC voltage. Make sure it's reading correctly. And as long as everything is fine, you don't have to recalibrate it. It'll be fine. And like I say, really nice meters have some nice, especially the high power, low power ohms functions really nice for checking the function of, of semiconductors. And I've, I showed that in the other video that I did of this. You know, go watch that one. And I'll, that, that shows me actually how the high ohms can actually turn on a semiconductor. But uh, there you go. I thought I'd do a little bit more detailed, um, you know, video on this meter, especially the calibration procedure. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed. Maybe, uh, maybe you learned something.